let's start. I see now Carlos here. So it is my pleasure to, intro to introduce you to, to Carlos Hidalgo. Carlos Hidalgo is the director of the National Laboratory of Fusion in CMAT, Spain. And he's been, uh, has a long career in fusion research and fusion education as well. He was also my teacher at, uh, during my master's degree. So it's always happy to have him here. And yeah, please, Carlos, uh, the floor is yours to, to talk to, to the students present in this, in this uh, session. Okay, thank you, Dari. Of course, it's a great pleasure uh, to be in this uh, session with a new generation of uh, scientists and uh, engineers uh, with interest in this global dream, which is uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, I need to uh, share my my screen, but I have troubles. Uh, do you allow? You should allow me to share the screen. So I try, but I get a message. Okay, now, yes. Sorry, yeah, sorry, I was muted. You should be able now to. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I think you can. Okay. Do, do you see now my screen? Uh, yes, Carlos, we can we can see you. Okay, very good. Uh, so yes, this is going to be a overview of uh, of TMAT science and technology programs. Um, and do you see now I am in the slide number two? Is working well? Dario, do you see now this? Yes, yes, Carlos, it's, it's going. Yes, to... okay, very good. So uh, um, I think you are fully aware that there is a very uh, active discussion uh, in the whole community at Europe and at a global scale to make our dreams a reality, which means fusion energy uh, for society. And probably you are fully aware of the ongoing discussion uh, about the European fusion roadmap, discussion that is still ongoing in 2023, where we have emphasized uh, three magic words. One is parallelization of activities for the acceleration of both a prototype of a fusion power plant that we call DEMO and without any doubt, this will be a, a, a tokamak, but also looking towards the development of fusion power plants. And this is an area where uh, here in Fiamat, we are fully convinced that these commercial fusion power plants will be a stellarator. But of course, to make a, our dreams a reality, we need one more key word, which means integration. Integration of both the science and the technology towards fusion energy. And actually, when, when, when we talk about what we do at FIAMAT, I think this is the magic work. We have a very unique integrated program on physics and technology, um, which means that we have a number of uh, important laboratories on, in the area of plasma science and also facilities to deal with the critical technologies for fusion uh, reactors, as well as a very deep um, capabilities in modeling and theory. All these activities, these two pillars, science and technology, are developed in the framework of truly international collaboration towards the development of fusion energy to make our dreams a reality. We have facilities in operation. This is a picture of the uh, TJ2 accelerator supporting uh, uh, the Beldenstein 7X program. We have uh, laboratories to deal with key technologies uh, for bringing blankets, uh, laboratories for liquid metals in operation in FIEMAT. We have uh, capabilities to develop advanced plasma diagnostic. This is uh, one of the detectors of the uh, heavy ion beam probe uh, developed uh, in collaboration now with Ukraine uh, at FIEMAT. Uh, we have facilities to explore plasma-facing components, both physics and technology, 
to address the challenge of uh, power exhaust when materials will be exposed to very high power densities. And we have also um, a very strong program of materials for fusion and neutron sources that are needed to validate uh, reactor technologies. This is done as an example in the framework of collaboration with uh, Japan and Spain, uh, LIPAC, Donetsk um, joint program. If you talk about science, and the science program uh, under, uh, uh, in, in FIEMAT. Um, of course, here I should emphasize our existing capabilities in the Stellarator, TG2 Stellarator, but also our deep involvement in the JET program, TG2 is strongly connected with Belmestan 7X, our participation in JT60, Dones, ITER, and beyond ITER demo um, uh, as a, a commercial and beyond them of the commercial fusion power plants. If I uh, want to highlight three areas in the area of science, I will emphasize our capabilities for diagnostics, our capabilities in the area of liquid metals and power exhaust, um, and our capabilities in concept optimization, particularly the emphasis in the optimization of accelerators. All our program is done with a key goal that means have a model validation for, for reactor. Remember that a fusion reactor is an unknown territory where we need to have properly validated models so we can jump in this unknown territory. And of course, in this meeting, uh, I want to hi I'll highlight our uh, in, uh, in, in pillar on education and training that is needed to uh, make our dreams a reality. Um, if we talk about technology, um, the program in, in, in FIEMAT is in, including, as I said before, uh, quite many technology facilities and with a strong connection with new, uh, new facilities right now under construction, that is the, the, the program IFNIF, EVEDA and DONES, and uh, of course, our uh, technological program supporting ITER, DEMO, and uh, the, 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 the fusion power plants. If I want to highlight three areas where we have a strong program, of course, materials in one of these pillars, accelerators technology, very much connected with, with Donetsk, and um, liquid metals and tritium uh, technology, connected with the breathing blanket um, issues. Again, model validation is a key ingredient. Here, model validation is more focused in the area of, of materials, um, tritium technology. And again, um, um, education and training is a key ingredient looking into, into the future where we need a new generation. If we talk about uh, what are the, the strategic uh, of objectives of FIEMAT? And so what is the, co the, the program connected with these uh, strategic objectives? Uh, uh, in, a few, in a few words, I will say the number one, of course, ITER, uh, is this is very crucial. Uh, um, uh, we have a strong program in the development of ITER diagnostics, that acquisition supporting also FIEMAT, all the JET program, JT60 SA as a new device uh, that uh, got first plasmas uh, last month in October 2023. The objective number two is very much connected with our vision about the future that uh, commercial fusion power plants will be accelerators. And so we have a very strong program on accelerators and uh, support in Bendestein, TJ2, and beyond these devices, I will say a few words later. The objective number three is very much with theory and simulation uh, because we need to, to have confidence in our predictions in reactor scenarios, particularly in the area of accelerator optimization. 
I get the number four is the area of technology for materials. Uh, materials means structural, functional materials, validation of materials, and very important uh, um, means to push the development and operation of fusion neutron sources that are crucial for the validation of materials and uh, reactor technologies. And number five is the development of demo and reactor technologies where we have uh, a strong program on breathing blankets, tritium mm, mm, technology, and plasma phasing components. And last but not least, and very important in this meeting, is the, how we try to involve the community, the universities, the industry, including uh, in this uh, area, the, 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 the strategic goal of education and training of a new generation. Uh, I will not go into many details, just a few highlights so you get a flavor of what we are doing at FIEMAT. If we talk about ITER, as I said before, we have a program on diagnostics, uh, development for ITER, data acquisition, and visualization. Um, just to give you a flavor, right now we are just in the final step of uh, the, uh, the design of one of the key diagnostics for ITER, it will be the, the visible infrared system. Uh, the design is, is, is in, for pole number 12, it is almost ready. So very soon, hopefully in next year, we will start the construction uh, in collaboration with industry. Yeah, keep in mind that the length of the system is more than 15 meters. So indeed, it's a very massive. And right now we are working in the design of the new poles, 12, 17, 3 and 9, and construction will start a bit later. So this is a, a clear way to support ITER with key diagnostics. But also we support ITER with this involvement in, in JET that, uh, as you remember, uh, got a record uh, in 2022. And today, November 23, there is a formal communication about something very important is the reproducibility of the results in JET, very crucial. Here in Fiamat, we have been deeply involved in scenario development, LH transition, disruption mitigation, and plasma war. But also at FIEMAT, we are looking into the future. And JT60 uh, is a European and Japanese device. Here you can see the European flag, the Japanese flag, and here in the bottom, the Spanish flag, because we have been deeply involved in the development of this facility. Uh, right now, we put a lot of effort in the development of technologies for the AT60, means pellet systems, FIAMAT in collaboration with industry, and the development of key diagnostics. Fast ion diagnostics are developed not by FIAMAT, by Seville University, and this is very, very key diagnostic for the scientific exploitation of the AT60. At FIAMAT, we are just starting the design of Doppler reflectometry for turbulence and plasma profiles. This is just a view of how we are doing the design of Doppler reflectometry and this is one of the pellet systems in operation um, and, and at, at, at FIEMAT. Accelerators, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, in FIEMAT we are fully convinced that the, the real business in fusion, the, the real uh, commercial fusion power plant will be accelerators and so uh, because this is our belief. We put a lot of emphasis in accelerators. Uh, TD2 is uh, in, in operation uh, at FIEMAT. Next campaign will start in a few months from now. The whole program in TD2 uh, is covering all the areas of uh, interest for the key uh, uh, accelerator in operation in Europe and in, in, at a global scale, Venice and 7X, we have a strong program in transport confinement, MSD, fast particle physics, particle fueling, neutral dynamics, plasma edge, scrape of layer, plasma wall interaction. Uh, we have developed some key diagnostics like dual heavy ion beam probes that allows us to address one of the really key elements uh, 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 for reactor, which is the validation of fast particle physics and the role of these dynamics to trigger self-organization, to give just an example. 
But also we look, and we'll talk about it later, we look into the future. We are deeply involved in the next generation of optimized accelerator uh, devices that keeps all the great results from Bendestein that have proved you know, classical and MSD optimization. Um, um, and we look now for optimized second generation uh, the accelerator for fast ion confinement and plasma turbulence, which is also very crucial. Uh, we look for magnetic configurations that are not only sufficiently optimized, but also that can be extrapolated uh, towards reactors. So we, we look at kind of similarity arguments, uh, wind tunnel experiments that uh, could be um, uh, extrapolated in the next step towards commercial fusion power plants and also this device will be a test bed for uh, established and exploratory reactor technologies. Materials and uh, neutral sources. Yes, we do have a very strong program in, in, in key areas of technologies that are crucial to have a credible uh, fusion reactor. In materials, uh, we have a very strong and long-standing activities both in what we call functional materials, for instance, we are doing uh, um, um, validation of material supported inter diagnostics and structural materials. Uh, um, Stand still, uh, we look for, for the properties and correlation between microstructural and mechanical properties of structural material, and also very important. We have a strong program in modeling and validation in the area of radiation uh, um, damage um, induced by, in particular, neutrons, and how uh, these structural defects uh, will interact with uh, dislocations and affecting the mechanical properties. Because I mentioned uh, uh, our activities in, in, in validation of materials, of course, I want to highlight all our program towards uh, neutron sources um, and the validation of materials and the, the very extreme condition that uh, we'll face in our reactor with, uh, with fast neutrons. Uh, so our activities connected both donors with the, the broader approach collaboration in Japan, and we have many uh, CMAT colleagues working in the pack in Rockcastle. Um, um, this is a linear accelerator that is validating the, the engineering of, of Dones. And you see this picture of three faces, we are smiling. Uh, we are quite happy because we have uh, in 2023, uh, so far the conclusion is that um, uh, the design for Donis is, is feasible. Um, and I think this is indeed one of the key uh, strategic area in Europe and all over the world to have a credible uh, reactors, uh, materials validation. But also we have a strong activity in what we call reactor technologies, in particular breathing blankets. Remember, um, for sure you are fully aware, in a reactor, we need to produce tritium. Um, in principle, it sounds very simple. Just you need lithium, fast neutrons, and you will get tritium. Um, then you need some kind of technology to have neutron uh, multipliers, could be using beryllium. And you have some basic technology to have lithium that allows you, once we have the fast neutrons coming from the, from, from the, from the reactor, to produce tritium on site. Um, then while you get the tritium, you just need to put tritium into the core of the reactor. It's, it looks very simple, but it, it's, it's not so simple. Uh, so we have a strong program to, to, to validate this technology. And again, Donet is not only a materials uh, um, validation facility, it's also a, and will be a key facility for the basic validation of tritium technology at here at the mat, we are also deeply involved in the design of irradiation models for testing breathing blanket. Breathing blanket means also liquid metals. So we have a very active uh, program uh, on 
liquid metals uh, of Fiemat. We have different facilities to look into the problem of uh, corrosion with liquid metals, purification of liquid metals, tritium ext ext extraction. We are right now actually building uh, uh, a new uh, liquid metal loop uh, that it will be focused mainly in the area of purification, uh, supporting the Donetsk facility um, uh, in, in, in Granada. So yes, uh, uh, at Fiemat, uh, we have um, um, we have what I, I mentioned at the beginning a unique integrated program in physics and technology towards fusion energy, because to make our dreams a reality, we need to make ITER a great success, and we have a strong commitment with ITER. We need to look into commercial fusion power plants. And uh, we are fully convinced that the, the future is in a accelerator. And we need the theory and simulation because we need to predict with confidence unknown territory, which is the, the scenarios of reactors. And we need to address the key gaps on technology, which means validation of materials uh, for reactors, which means to have as soon as possible. Uh, fusion neutron sources in operation in Europe. And we have strong commitment for the development of reactor technologies, including breathing blankets um, uh, technologies. Uh, and all these activities goes together in, in, in Tiamat. And of course, if we look into the future, we pay attention to the human factor and the human factor is due. And so means that for us, the training program and getting a new generation of science engineers is crucial for the success of our dreams. Fusion for society, and, and that's why uh, in, in FIAMAT, training program is a key priority. And I think this is a short view of a long story in, in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, so you get a flavor of what is FIAMAT and what is the strategy of our program. Thank you very much for your attention. Carlos, thank you very much for this very nice overview of, yeah, indeed, what all the all the areas that have been uh, working in Siemat for the development of fusion. Uh, so I think this is the time where we open the floor for questions. Uh, we're not gonna allow uh, too many of them because we see Olaf already in line, <laughs> but in the meantime, Please, uh, the students, as usual, uh, uh, write your question on the chat or on the uh, or raise your hand. And while they do that, Carlos, I think I'm gonna start with a quick question uh, regarding the the, the how, what are the possibilities for master students to actually join a, a project in CMAT or to do their master thesis in CMAT? Because I think this is important to know. You have a lot of topics, like you mentioned. So for, for master students, European master students that are following us, what would be the, what's the possibilities or how, how, how should they do? I think that the possibilities are, are, are great because uh, uh, whatever are your interests, either more in the more scientific aspect or in the pure technology aspect, I think uh, we will have a specific um, area for your interest. Uh, we are growing a lot in the number of young people. We need uh, this uh, new generation. And so whatever is your area of interest, please contact us. And I'm pretty sure that we will find something fascinating for the development of your career. Because I think the, the key message for the new generation is that, that there are plenty of opportunities in the coming years for uh, fusion science and technology, in particular in Fiat. Great, Carlos. That's that's good to know, and also for everybody to know how can they, uh, yeah, how can they join, join Ciamat uh, with this. Um, I don't see any questions in the meantime. Uh, from the chat, not even. So, yeah. So I think with this, uh, wanna thank you a lot, Carlos. And I, I, I imagine you are available for students to contact you. For, yes, uh, for any <laughs> any question, I have also to mention uh, to to the students present here 
that Carlos is part of the Fusion Network of Governors. So he's really involved in, in our activities. And yeah, we, CMAT is a long-standing partner of Fusionet, and we, we are happy to, to count CMAT among our network. So thank you so much, Carlos, for, for being thank here. Thank you. For your thoughts. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Okay, with this, we welcome the second speaker of this session, uh, Olaf Grulke. So Olaf Grulke is part of the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, uh, the branch that is located in Greifswald, Germany. And he is working on uh, the Stellarator Wendelstein 7X. Um, yeah, he will he will tell us more about the, the current activities that are been uh, that have been uh, taking place at, at Wendelstein 7X. So Olaf, thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> yeah. So good. What is it? Morning, afternoon, good noon. <laughs> Morning. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, let me share my. I cannot share my screen. Yeah, one second. I'm going to make you a co-host. One second. Okay. Yeah, you should be able now to share your screen. Good. So yes. um, I will present essentially what we're doing here at uh, IPP Greifswald, and that is all dealing with the Stellarator W7X. and. Um, oops, make it um, I'll give you a little outline. Um, for those of you who don't know about Stellarators or W7X in particular, I will give you some um, overview about the magnetic confinement concept, the device, um, how it looks like, um, which is quite sophisticated. Um, it will give you a little outline what our mission is. So that uh, the experiment has a certain purpose and I want to share with you what we're aiming at. Um, second part, I will give you a little flavor about our, well, quite recent key scientific achievements, which is mostly um, along long pulse operation and high performance plasmas. And uh, the last point, I will well, give you a little overview of what are the opportunities, especially for young scientists at our institute in Greifswald particularly. Okay, coming to um, well, the, the concept of the device, um, I wasn't sure too much um, about the audience and how deeply you're involved in fusion, but if we talk about magnetic confinement, uh, you always need to fulfill um, kind of the basic requirements. So you need to form a magnetic field with these nested magnetic flux surfaces and magnetic field lines here will be uh, winding on those flux surfaces, but not deviating from that. <clears throat> and if you have such a con uh, configuration and you put a plasma in there, then the pl plasma pressure is being balanced by the essentially um, Lorentz force, if you like, uh, by the currents in the plasma together with the confining magnetic field. So this is the principal um, configuration. And there are essentially two major concepts how to achieve that. And probably a lot of you have heard about a tokamak, where you um, shape this kind of configuration by essentially two ingredients. First, you have external magnetic field coils on the right here in blue. And those external magnetic field coils generate one part of the uh, magnetic field. But secondly, you use the plasma itself by driving inductively a very strong uh, toroidal current in the plasma, which gives you the second component for the twisting of the helical, um, helical winding of the magnetic field, uh, field lines. Um, and this current is inductively driven by a usually pretty big central solenoid. Um, so this concept is very good in terms of magnetic confinement, has been proven to, to have the record values of confinement and, and plasma performance so far, but it has its issues because um, the inductive uh, current drive um, means that it's very challenging to run such um, a concept in steady state, what we believe is an essential part if you want to facilitate that as a reactor, fusion reactor concept. And the second part is the currents you drive in the plasma are pretty big. So we're talking about mega amps of current and <clears throat> the plasma doesn't like that big currents, uh, which gives rise to instabilities and finally disruptions, which is really a threat, a really mechanical threat for any of those concepts and a lot of concepts really focusing on 
mitigating those enormous forces that appear in these very um, quick disruptions. The alternative is a stellarator. And a stellarator, so there is not no, well, the tokamak, all tokamaks essentially look the same. Well, there are some details, but um, a stellarator has a wide, uh, very wide range of flexibility of different magnetic field configuration. And that um, aspect stems from the fact that the entire confining magnetic field is generated by external uh, magnetic field coils. So um, you have a lot of freedom to form different, uh, different geometries of the magnetic field by changing the coil system. Um, but this comes to an expense. The expense is that your external magnetic field coil system is getting much more complicated. So you can see here you need um, conceptually two sets of coils. You need the same as for, for tokamak for the toroidal uh, magnetic field component. But um, since you don't have a current in the plasma, you need these helical windings you know, to really superimpose the twist. Um, and what is shown here is what is called classical stellarator. So you really have this helical winding. The winding is um, really winding around the entire um, the entire vessel, which has its drawbacks. Well, first, if you have external field coils, you can run um, this device intrinsically steady state because you can leave the magnetic field on as much as you or as long as you like, especially if you make that superconducting. But you need to you need to have a more clever concept to get rid of these helical coils because, as you can see, maintenance of such a reactor device um, is basically impossible because you you cannot really disassemble anything. Now, so you got to merge somewhat these um, these toroidal field coils with the helical um, coil system, which is called modular system. Um, and I will show you in a minute uh, the rea realization we have at WSMX. Uh, which uses these modular coil systems. Okay. Uh, the stellarator WSMX is a stellarator, so magnetic field is externally generated by, um, by coils. It's superconducting, which means we can run the magnetic field literally forever. Um, so it's not a pulsed machine in terms of magnetic field system. You can see here um, the kind of a flux surface, so essentially the plasma shape. Um, so in our case, it has a five-fold toroidal symmetry here. Uh, so you can see each of these sections are symmetric um, with the other section, and each section individually is mirror symmetric along its center. And the reason for that is to, to save too many different coil shapes so that we can reduce the number. Anyway, so this is the, the set of superconducting coils, how this um, is being generated. You can see um, the expense, what I'm talking about. So to make it modular, you're ending up with these very weirdly shaped magnetic field coils. And if you look carefully, you of course see the toroidal component, for example, but here you still see the how the helical windings are more or less embedded in these individual coil systems. Um, so you're ending up with non-planar coils, which is um, challenging in terms of shape manufacturing and also by um, in terms of supporting the forces from the magnetic field. So we have four, 50 non-planar coils, low temperature superconducting coils around the machine, um, five different types because of the symmetry. Um, we added 20 planar superconducting coils on top of that. Um, and this is essentially because W7X finally is an experiment, and for experiment, you need variations. And those uh, planar superconducting coils are meant to um, allow for significant changes of the magnetic field structure for experimental purposes. Uh, you got to connect all that. So we have a lot of lines for cooling. Uh, it's being cooled by liquid helium. Uh, down to 3.4 uh, Kelvin. You need all the current leads, so it's getting to very complicated support and supply structure. You have to put everything into a cryostat. Um, and if you finish the device, it looks like this one. So, And here you can see that it's really an experiment because it's less a vacuum vessel. It's more like a Swiss cheese structure with a lot of, uh, a lot of parts. 
So in total, we have more than 250 parts we, because we want to diagnose very carefully the plasma, got to heat the plasma and so on and so on. Um, to give you the, the key um, the key machine parameters, so it has a diameter of 16 meters, so it's relatively big, um, has a mass of a little more than 700 tons, and out of this total mass, more than 400 tons is really um, chilled down to 3.4 Kelvin, so that's the superconducting system. Good. So this is um, the W7X device, which is now in operation routinely um, for, well, a number of years, I would say. So in more detail, this is the magnetic field configuration. So what I'm showing here is one um, magnetic flux surface, and the red line is tracing a magnetic field line as it goes around um, the magnetic flux surface. And down here, you can ignore the red part here. In blue, you can see how the magnetic field varies when you follow the magnetic field line. Um, the first aspect, and this is intrinsic for stellarators, since you're avoiding, and this comes from very simple principles, yeah, essentially, you know that when you integrate the magnetic field along a closed contour, you're ending up with a current being encircled by this, um, by this contour. Uh, for tokamak, this allows then to make really the this highly symmetric magnetic field structure. For stellarator, which doesn't have any plasma current internally, at least no net current, you can see that um, to fulfill this one, you're indispensably ending up with a three-dimensional magnetic field structure. And that makes a stellarator from the geometry point of view much more complicated than a, uh, than a tokamak. Okay, um, the design of this magnetic field for W7X was aiming at, so if you look at this variation of the magnetic fields in blue, you can see this relatively large scale variation, especially when the magnetic field is, is going through from the inboard side to the outboard side, but you can also see these small, the small variations here. And the design of uh, W7X is, uh, was shooting to make this variation as small as possible. And the reason for that is that um, you can trap plasma particles in these little magnetic field wells. And when they're getting trapped, they very quickly radially drift out of the plasma. And that is an inc increased transport, essentially the neoclassical transport as it is called. And um, if you look at a, tr well, a diffusion overview um, in a comparison between stellarators and, and tokamaks, um, so what is shown here on the bottom is the diffusion of, here yeah, in the case of electrons, over what is collisionality, but you can think of the x-axis as density. So going from left to right, we're going for increased density. Um, and you can see for tokamak, the well-known scaling, a tokamak is very good as, at low collisionality, is very good in confinement, very low diffusion, and then you have here these various regimes, well-known. Uh, going to the plateau regime and the fish litter regime and so on. A steroid, especially at lower collisionalities, is different. Um, if you don't have or barely have any collisions, so low density, then this trapping of particles in these magnetic field wells is unperturbed. So you cannot collisionally detrap those particles so they can really make their way um, radially outwards, which uh, means you have a strongly increased diffusion, so strongly increased radio transport. No? So what you want to do, go is you want to go for higher collisionalities, which means high density operation. Then you, you're slowly approaching the tokamak confinement. No? And if you superimpose um, a, self, well, a radial electric field, which is self-consistent um, due to the different diffusion of electrons and ions, as in W7X, you can see you can reduce this branch further. No? So we are shooting for W7X to reduce the neoclassical um, transport as much as possible, potentially going to the tokamak levels at medium uh, collisionalities. Uh, and this is by reducing really this magnetic field level. The second, let's say, optimization is, um, which is crucial for all fusion experiments, you need to get rid of whatever you put into the plasma, which means you need to get rid of the energy you put in and um, more importantly, the particles. So you need a good exhaust structure. For Tokamax, it's well established that you have this diverter. The diverter uh, plates are designed to withstand a lot of heat and you're in a controlled way, dump the plasma to the diverter plates 
where it, uh, where it eventually recombines and then you're adding strong pumping behind that to pump all away that is coming out of the plasma. Due to the three-dimensional structure of stellar radar, such a diverter concept is challenging because you cannot simply um, make these toroidally symmetric um, diverging magnetic field structure. Uh, the concept of W7X is to use uh, the plasma or the magnetic field structure itself um, to form such a diverter concept. Um, since we have well, what is called resonant surfaces, the result of that is that we're forming in the edge, what is shown here, these edge magnetic island structures. Now, so what is shown here is are the flux surfaces um, of the magnetic, uh, magnetic field. Uh, and you have these kind of isolated individual magnetic field structures um, at the edge, which are, uh, which are called magnetic islands. And so the idea is everything that escapes the confinement region enters these um, magnetic islands, flows along the plug surfaces of the magnetic islands, and then you can collect the particles with diverter plates intersecting those islands relatively far away from the main plasma. So to avoid that all these particles immediately get back into the main confinement and thereby fuel and you lose a lot of control of the plasma and so on. Yeah. So here yeah, it's a modern detail. So th those are kind of the two separate tree C's um, of the magnetic um, island, as is shown here. And then you intersect the magnetic islands with diverter plates and material plates you know, and try to collect the heat. You can see here strike lines, so the heat um, and thereby also the particles on those diverter plates. Yeah? So this is an essential part. Um, and you need that if you go to a reactor, because finally, um, in a reactor, your helium ash, so the result of your fu fusion, is something you can really carefully and efficiently need to remove from the main plasma. Good. So this is how it looks, the diverter concept in 3D. So again, the flux surface. And you can see that uh, it's getting more complicated. We need to shape the diverter plates um, to the cha rate, uh, toroidally changing magnetic flux surface. We in total have 10 of those diverter modules, two per, uh, per magnetic field symmetry line, one top, one bottom, and then we repeat that um, five times, so 10 in total. Good, coming to the main scope of W7X, um, and this is has been formulated from the beginning. Um, First one is that one could build such a uh, complicated magnetic field structure uh, device. So the feasibility of modular coils and high quality of the magnetic flux surface, we have already shown that and published that. So this is all done. Machine is built and has the properties as we expected. It. Um, then I mentioned um, uh, the big strength of stellarators is that you can run long pulses. Um, essentially steady state. So long pulse operation where the target value um, is that we demonstrate 30 minute of plasma operation at reasonable heating energies and plasma performance, which corresponds to 18 gigajoule of energy turnaround. Uh, so 18 gigajoule of heating energy, if you like. Um, and then we have several aspects like um, that we have good properties, especially when we go for high plasma pressures so that our equilibrium stays stable, that we are MHD stable, uh, which requires high beta operation, that we have very good neoclassical confinement. I will show you the results in a minute, but we have published that and demonstrated that. Magnetic field geometry got to be stiff for the diverter um, concept to, to work because of the magnetic field structure changes a lot when you put a plasma in. Then, of course, your diverter is wrong to the magnetic flux surface. For that, it needs to be stiff. Uh, we want to demonstrate um, that we have very good fast particle, fast ion confinement, which is essentially for a fusion device, you need to confine the alpha, alpha particle. So the 3.5, so roughly um, mega electron volt um, alpha particle coming out of the fusion reaction. Um, we need to demonstrate compatible core edge scenarios. So bringing the diverter into play and eventually we will change for, to a reactor rather than first wall, which is essentially all metallic wall. So if you make that in, in short, the mission of W7 is to demonstrate the physics basis for a stellarator reactor concept. So this is the main goal, to demonstrate that a reactor has the confinement and exhaust capability to be scaled to a fusion reactor. Finally. 
Good. Um, give you just a taste of um, where we stand. WSI Max is a relatively novel machine. We had the very first plasma operation in 2015 um, without any diverter structure. So this was more technical demonstration. The first decent campaign we conducted in 17 and 18 already with um, with diverter modules, but nothing was water cooled, so not long pulse operation capable. And over the last four years, we essentially added a lot of water cooling and a new diverter structure, which is now fully water cooled. So this is was the final step for finalization of the machine, and we have run um, quite recently ended uh, in this year our first campaign with the first fully water cooled machine, um, and could achieve our first milestones in operation. So it's a relatively fresh machine, um, which is interesting from a physics aspect because it's not that everything has been already done, which is important. Um, some, i skip that, some key um, scientific issues. We, as I mentioned, we have demonstrated already the neoclassical transport um, optimization. And the easiest way to do that is, so what is shown here, is essentially um, what um, we have uh, the power loss we have due to neoclassical transport. So the, the neoclassical heat flux times the surface of the flux surface um, gives you uh, gives you the power. And if you divide that by the power you put into the plasma, your heating power, then it's pretty clear you cannot um, you cannot access anything that is bigger than one. So you cannot lose more power than you put in. Um, of course. And if we take our best performing plasmas, this is W7X, where you can see that the neoclassical power loss is way, way smaller than actually our input power. And if you would do the same for these classical stellarators, so non-optimized stellarator device, um, like um, our Japanese colleague um, are still operating, then you would end up with such a curve so that um, with the same performance as we had in a classical stellarator, your neoclassical losses were would be would far exceed uh, what you put in. So this is uh, that performance would not have been possible. Um, so that is, I think, the most direct uh, demonstration of the neoclassical optimization. In turn, what you can see, you still have this big uh, chunk of power loss you need to cover. Um, and um, in fact, we see in W7X that the transport is getting much, much more like an Atacama, that a huge part of our um, of our power losses is uh, regulated by turbulent um, by turbulent transport, uh, which is interesting because so far uh, stellarators um, have always been strongly dominated by neoclassical losses, and this is not the case for W7X. Um, we can play around with that because these turbulent losses are not going into the details. We can influence the turbulence by shaping our plasma profiles in one way. So this is quite a busy figure, but what we use is our my, main heating is electron heating via electron cyclotron resonance, and we have neutral beam injection. And if we add neutral beam injection, what we can generate is this, this, this on the right hand side, this is a radial density profile that in contrast to our normal profiles, which are relatively fat, flat, we can steepen up the density towards the core. And with these superimposed density gradients, we can stabilize the turbulence. And once we do that, you can see that we get exceptionally good performance, which is here quantified via the um, iron temperature, uh, which is strongly in, uh, increasing in the phases when we suppress the turbulence. Um, and this is um, our high performance regime um, where we, where our transport essentially falls back to our neoclassical level, uh, which is uh, which is very good. Um, and we have to dig into that topic a little deeper. Second big point is, um, and I'll show you a picture, we had our uh, achieved our first milestone of an energy turnaround of more than one gigajoule. Um, you can see here the discharge on the right hand side, a visible camera image into the device where you see the plasma. And this is actually a movie, so it's not a still picture, but um, it demonstrates at the end, we're losing some gyrotrons for, for heating, but to demonstrate that in the main phase, uh, just quickly in the main phase, we get a very stable, 
uh, uneventful plasma, and this is what it what it's supposed to be. Uh, so we can run, and here this is a discharge which lasts already for eight minutes. You can run long um, discharges, eight minute, not at full heating power. So we're putting in three megawatts here. Uh, we will repeat that in our next campaign, which way might uh, way more heating power, but it demonstrates already that we're in a good path for steady state, long pulse operation. Good, and finally, before I end, figure of merit is always this fusion triple product. Um, and what is shown here is all the blue dots are a collection of tokamaks, which perform very well and have record values for a relatively short duration of plasma operation. And then they degrade if they want to make very long pulses. Um, and here, these triangles are W sub X in, in various configurations. You can see, well, we have demonstrated already a record value for steroider triple products, but we are still a little off the, uh, the tokamak. We got to work on that. But we can maintain this performance to relatively long discharges. Yeah? So we are here in the 100 second range where we are getting much, much better than the tokamaks. And the idea is to push these performance up to the tokamak level and stabilize that for very long parts so that we're ending up here. So this um, and a lot of the other goals fall also in, into this category. So uh, we're working on these high performance. Good. And finally, just one slide about opportunities, um, which is relatively simple. So we are at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics and Grifes, and you can see the institute up there. I put up here a map just to give you some orientation. So we are in the far east, north of Germany, directly at the Baltic coast. Um, and it's a pretty big institute. So we have uh, roughly 450 employees, and those are subdivided into four scientific divisions, three experimental and one stellarator theory division. Um, we have already a very strong um, graduate program, so a PhD school, um, which is called HEP. Uh, you can Google that, uh, which is called HEP. And within the school currently, we have and this reflects more or less our base level. Um, currently, we have 32 running PhD projects at W7X at our institute. Uh, so that's the level. And um, so this is just PhD. We have also a, a strong postdoc program and also go for master or bachelor students. Um, so the only thing I can tell you, and I, I, I heard what, uh, what Carlos was mentioning, this spans really essentially all aspects of experimental fusion physics or, or uh, theoretical studies and unsolicited applications are always welcome. Um, so um, if you go to this, uh, to this graduate school page, you can see that there's an online version where you can submit your, um, your papers, especially for PhD and um, that will be distributed. Okay, so that's all I have, thank you very much. Olaf, thank you very much for this very comprehensive presentation of what's going on in Wendelstein. Thank you very much also for that very last slide saying about the opportunities uh, for for students to go there, uh, especially for the for the PhD school, which I hope that that uh, master students who wish to follow a PhD career can also look into that. I would like to ask you uh, for the current master students, what are the possibilities for them to if they if they are working or planning to have a master thesis project, how could they contact uh, you at at uh, at Graduate to see if there if there possibility for them to 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 do their the graduation project uh, along with with collaboration with Graduate? Um. So this is not that streamlined as PhD projects. Um. The. So there are, there are two ways. Either you contact the, um, if you if you go through the IPP websites, um, there's a careers page and each of these divisions have a contact if you're interested in a particular, well, in the set of topics in, in that division. Uh, and, and you can basically just um, apply, well, apply is a big word, but you can, you can start communicating about put, uh, possibilities via email just by sending an email there. That will be normally by the secretaries uh, distributed among the entire uh, division. And then um, 
one could talk about uh, potential projects. Uh, it, it requires a little longer discussion because you, well, the master depends on at what institution you do the master, who is the supervisor. And we have some um, we have some interaction with, with the Greifswald University and other universities across Europe. Uh, but all that needs to be discussed. And as you know, there are, there are various schemes you could pursue um, in these, especially in the master on the master project track. Um, so it requires a lot of discussion in what framework, who's supervising, at what university is the master, what is the universities all have different boundary conditions in length and content. And, uh, and this needs to be, of course, incorporated in the work. Uh, so that requires a little more discussion, whereas PhD is much more straightforward because that got to be done in some of our partner universities. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, because I also would like to remind the, the, the students present here that both CMAT and, and IPP uh, Greiswald or Max Planck Institute are FUSENET members. So you can yeah. also access to FUSENET funding for, for internships or master thesis project uh, going to those institutions. We have a but, question. But, we have some questions. Uh, yeah, some maybe a side questions. remark. Sorry, a side remark for the master. It is always wise mm -hmm. to first plan for a shorter internship. Normally, we financially we normally get that through. I mean, we can we can support that just to get to know the people. If you don't know anyone, it's very hard just to talk about a master without having met. So, this is my advice. So this is how I do it. I would always first invite for four weeks internship just to get to know each other and discuss about potential projects. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the advice. Always useful advice. There are some questions in the chat. So although we are already in lunch time, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna uh, read the first question, and then perhaps uh, you can you can answer the second question uh, later on the chat. So I will I will go with uh, how do stellarators scale in terms of size compared to tokamax? Do we need an stellarator larger than ether to get net power out eventually? <clears throat> um. The size scaling, so the scaling of stellarators is not too different to Tokamaks. If you look at the confinement, the empirical confinement scaling, it, it is relatively close to an H mode uh, Tokamak scaling. Uh, so it's not too bad. Um, but yes, uh, a stellarator got to be big. A stellar, so a stellarator reactor got to be as big as a Tokamak reactor. At the moment, it's a little hard to. Uh, to answer the question because um, right now Tokamax going into the route of very high magnetic field. I'm not sure if you're uh, informed about the, especially our US colleague with the spark going for 20 Tesla um, superconducting field coils. Um, um, technologically, this is difficult for a just because of the forces and these non-planar coil types. So it depends if we can really go for, well, it will be challenging with the stellarator to go to, to those high fields and that uh, will determine um, the size finally of the reactor because the magnetic field is still the bigger scaling of that. The higher magnetic field you think, um, the smaller you can build the device. Now, but so far the stellarators and tokamak scale very similar. Thank you very much. Olaf, there is also another question on the chat. We would really appreciate if you could answer it directly on the on the chat itself. Right. Uh, in the meantime, we thank you for your participation. Um, and thanks a lot for the students. Um, and thank you for being present here in this talk.